My name is Ken Bailey, and I'm happy to have this opportunity to try and explore with you some of the deeper levels of the great section in the Gospel of Matthew and in Luke that we have traditionally called the Beatitudes. When we look at these, we of course are familiar with the fact that they are at the beginning of the great Sermon on the Mount, or as we have it in Luke, the Sermon on the Plain. The two forms are a bit different, and we don't need to go into all the technical arguments that have been raised across the past century or so to explain these differences because they are not that critical for our text, but a, a brief overlook at a few points of structure may be of interest. We do notice that Matthew, for example, has something quite, quite striking in the way he puts his gospel together in that he takes the sayings of Jesus puts them into one section, and then he has a long section on the things that Jesus does. And then we find another section talking about the things that Jesus says. These sayings of Jesus are, first of all, in chapters 1 to chapter 7, sorry, chapter 5 to chapter 7, and then another collection comes in chapter 13, the great parable chapter, another section in chapter 18, there is another section in chapter 23, and another section in chapter 10. So why is it that we have the sayings of Jesus put together in five sections? Aha! The answer is fairly simple. The first, first five books of the Old Testament, called the Pentateuch, are traditionally called the books of Moses, and so Moses had what he had to say, or what he had to write, as was traditionally understood, put into five sections, and so Matthew, who is trying to make a statement. He's trying to say Jesus is the new Moses, the one who calls up the new people and is the one who leads them out of the wilderness into the new promised land. And this new Moses is Jesus of Nazareth. So even as the first Moses, his sayings were put into five sections, so also the new Moses has his words put into five sections. The first of these is the one which we are looking at and we have traditionally called it the Sermon on the Mount. Many theories have been put out as to what brought this material together because we have a collection kind of like it in Luke, which also begins with the Beatitudes and also ends with the well-known parable about the man who, who built his house on the rock and the second man who built his house upon the sand, or as Luke has it, foundation and no foundation. So the collections are somewhat the same, except that Matthew's is much longer. Why? Well, one simple answer is this is an extended sermon of Jesus, and one time he delivers it the way we have it in Matthew, another time he delivers it the way we have it in Luke. Or another explanation that I think is perhaps quite possible is that the collection itself, probably the way Jesus taught it to his disciples, is perhaps the way we have it in Luke and that Matthew has taken this as a kind of an outline. And then he has found other material on the same subjects and has, from the, from the lips of our Lord, and has included them into the collection, and so the collection is a bit larger. In any case, we are looking now at the Beatitudes, and sure enough, they're a bit different from the ones that we have in Luke. One of the striking differences is that Luke gives us four positives, blessed are you for, you will receive this and this, and then parallel to them are four negatives. Woe to those who do this, and woe to those who do this. When we look at the four, we find that they are in a step parallelism. The one, two, three, four of the positives are matched by the one, two, three, four of the negatives, and the first two match, and the second two match, and the third match, and the fourth match. Matthew has a longer list. We have nine Beatitudes, no negatives at all. The same four that we have in Luke are there, but there are five others. Why has Matthew left out the negatives? Well, we're not sure. Very simply, perhaps he didn't have enough space. Because, you see, each one of the Gospel authors wants to record what they have to say about the life and ministry of Jesus on one piece of papyrus roll. The rolls were about 30 feet long, and if you go to a second roll, it's going to make the book too expensive. 
Matthew has lots of things to write. Certainly he had to cut out lots of things he would like to have included, like anybody who's putting together a book about a famous person, and perhaps he decided that the negatives, well, we don't really need those, they're good stuff, but, well, you can't include everything, and so he's left them out. There is another uh, question that is of some interest, and that is the fact that the earliest copies of the book of Matthew don't all have the Beatitudes in exactly the same order. Some of them have the second, Beatitude, the second Beatitude and the third one turned the other way around. Some of these are very early Greek texts, and particularly the early Latin versions are almost entirely in that fashion. The early Syriac versions are also written in that form. What difference does it make? Well, in meaning it really doesn't make any difference at all, except that when we do read it that way, then we have the beatitude on the poor in spirit and the meek come together as a pair, and then we find those who mourn and those who hunger and thirst come together, kind of almost as though we had pairs down the page. And that may well be true because the last two are about persecution. And so it could be that we have a set sets that go down the page in that fashion. But we will leave that aside and proceed looking rather at the traditional order, the order that has sort of come to us down the centuries, which we still have printed in our Bibles. So we notice that Jesus goes up the mountain, and he does so because he sees the crowds. His audience is not the crowds. His audience is the disciples. So he's giving an advanced seminar to his disciples because he is concerned about their relationship, their teaching, their discipling, their leading of the crowds. The word out to the crowds needs to be gotten to them. The disciples are going to participate in this. They need some special training to be able to do that. We're then, we then find that he sits down as do teachers in the Middle East and have all across the centuries, and the disciples are then gathered around them. The famous word that ordinarily we translate blessed is an important word. Because you see, in Hebrew, there were two words that carry this same idea. One word is baracha, and the other word is ashira. And then in Greek, we also have two words, and the two words carry the same meaning that we have of those two Hebrew words. Now, what are the difference in these words? One word, the word baracha, which is not the one we have in the Beatitudes, or that is the Greek equivalent is not in the Beatitudes, and it means where you're praying for something you don't have. O Lord, bless the meaning, meeting. O Lord, bless the sick. O Lord, bless so-and-so. She's going through a very tough time. O Lord, bless the children. You're asking for the blessing of God that you don't have. But the other word in Hebrew, asherah, and in Greek, makarios, is an affirmation of a quality of spirituality that you recognize already to be present. When you say, so-and-so is really a blessed person, so-and-so is a blessing to us in our fellowship, you're not asking for something you've recognized a quality of spirituality that is already there. Some folks read these Beatitudes as though they were sort of a, if you do this, you get this. So, blessed are the people who do this because here are the rewards that they will receive. But that's really not the way they're supposed to be read. We're supposed to read it as, look at the quality of the spirituality who are in this category they are, they are the folks who have these things. We find that when we look very carefully at the old Syriac, retranslated in about the year 150, way back in the second century, and Syriac is not the same language as Aramaic, but it's very close. And Jesus was speaking Aramaic, and so in well-known passages of the New Testament, when we look particularly at the old Syriac, that's way back there in the second century, of which we only have two copies and was only found in recent times, not the Peshetta that the Syriac church uses that was translated in the fourth century. Sometimes in well-known passages, we can sort of say to ourselves, aha, 
Here is, in a sense, the overtones of the language of Jesus, even behind the Greek text. So, the word we're using here is an affirmation of a quality of spirituality that is already present in these unique people who have heard and believed, and for them is the kingdom. So, how do our Beatitudes begin? Well, we start off, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew would prefer to put it. Well, what are we talking about when we talk with this uh, very big word and very important word, the poor in spirit? You'll remember that Luke merely says, Blessed are the poor. Actually, they're the same, because way back in Isaiah, in chapter 66, where the language that Jesus is using is borrowed. In verse 2, God says, But this is the man to whom I will look, he that is poor and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Now, if you know that this is the text behind the saying of Jesus, then you don't need the phrase in spirit. But if you think that that. Jesus is saying, blessed are the poor, by which you mean, well, you're much more blessed if you can't pay your bills or, or if you don't have any bread to feed your kids, then you need a little help because that's really not what it means. The word poor, as we have it here from Isaiah, on from Isaiah forward into the New Testament, started off as an economic word, meaning people who don't have enough to eat, and then it became a theological word. It became the word for the stance of the true believer. Why? Because the poor man is the man who knows he needs grace. He knows he needs help. We're not talking now about, about the proud poor, the, the, the farmer who doesn't have anything, or let's say the mountaineer in the hills of Kentucky who's who's not going to be beholden to anybody. He's going to make it on his own. I mean, he may live in a shack and only eat one meal a day, but he's not going to be beholden to anybody. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the person who knows he needs help. And that's the word that the biblical authors picked up and said, aha, this is the right word to describe the stance of the believer in the presence of God. Anyone who thinks they can make it on their own without the grace of God, they need to understand what the Bible is really saying because the true believer knows we're not going to make it on our own. Only with the gift of God's love, which we call his grace, given to us unearned, is going to make it possible for us to fulfill our responsibilities in this life. So, we're told that these kind of folks are blessed, and we notice that the kingdom is theirs. Now, when we come to this section, this uh, topic of the kingdom, it's a big, big subject. Why is it such a big subject? Because of the fact that in the New Testament, this topic deals with three paradoxes. What's a paradox? It's two ideas that are opposite and you can't resolve them. So, what are the paradoxes? Well, first of all, we're told that the kingdom has already come in Jesus Christ. Here we are. The poor have the kingdom. And at the same time, we're told in many places that the kingdom is yet in the future. We pray the Lord's Prayer and say, Thy kingdom come, obviously talking about something we don't already have. All right, here's our first paradox. Think, if you please, about uh, a, a train running on a train track. If you take one of those tracks and tear it off, the train's going to wreck. And if you take the other track and remove it, the train's going to wreck. And if you widen the tracks out, it's going to wreck. And if you try and put them together, it's going to wreck. They're supposed to be in tension, in precise parallel. Well, the faith which we receive from the apostles and prophets and from our Lord, sometimes we can understand it, and sometimes it has to be dissolved into mystery. So what is the mystery we're talking about here? We're talking about in some sense the kingdom has come, and in some very profound sense the kingdom is yet in the future. There's our first train track. 
The second is that the kingdom is just about to arrive. And we have verses like, the people here are not going to see death until they see the kingdom coming in power. It's just almost completed. And then Jesus tells parables and makes statements in which he says, hey, cool it, take it easy, it's going to be a long time. Well, how can we talk about a kingdom that is just about to happen and it's still a long ways off? Don't put them together. You can't. And the third paradox, or the third train, if you like, is when we talk about the fact that nobody knows when the fullness of the kingdom will come at the end of time. And here are the signs. Well, what did you give us the signs for, Lord, if we're not supposed to try and figure it out? All right, there we are. You are not supposed to try and figure it out because you're never going to come up with an answer. So don't waste your energies. And here are the signs. So when we think of this subject, we have to think and always keep in balance these six themes put together in three sets of paradoxes. And we notice that this kingdom is already there. I'm sure that many of the people listening to Jesus were very, very shocked to hear him say these words. Why? Because they thought that they were going to bring in the kingdom through political and military power. They were going to conquer the land. They were going to drive out the Romans. They were going to get all those Gentiles out of there. They were going to recreate a pure Jewish state of nothing but Orthodox believers, and they would have the kingdom. No, says Jesus, the poor in spirit for them is the kingdom. The old Syriac puts this in a very nice way where it reads, we can translate it literally, how joyous it is for the poor in spirit in that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, the second line is not a reward for the first line. If you're poor in spirit, the Lord will give you the kingdom. Notice how it goes. How joyous it is for the poor in spirit in that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right, then we turn to the second of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, what is it that we're supposed to mourn about? You know, these, these great stay, sayings of Jesus are in a sense like an accordion. You can take them and you can sort of spread them out and they're almost limitless. There is one French scholar who has written two volumes of 500 pages each just trying to explain these nine Beatitudes. So they're almost limitless. But we do try and we're going to try and at least catch some of the high points of what we are confident is here being said. What is it that we're supposed to mourn over? Why is it that those who mourn are blessed? Well, uh, certainly we can agree that there are many things that we really don't learn of the deep things of the Spirit until we've suffered a bit. That suffering in itself is a tremendous teacher, and somehow the deep things of the Spirit don't break through to us until we've got a little track record and have had a few bumps, and then all of a sudden those bumps shake up our priorities, and we discover things that we didn't think were important before that are all of a sudden very, very important. As one who has been obliged to flee from, from war on a numerous occasions, all of a sudden you find out that everything you own is a pile of junk, and that all that really matters is your life and the life of your family and your friends. And all of that junk can go, who cares? And you don't really learn that until you discover that you are under pressure and there is threat and suddenly the life of your family and yourself and your friends all of a sudden has worth over all of that junk that you thought was so important. Way back in the fifth century, a very thoughtful Greek by the name of Aeschylus of Athens made a very profound statement about the nature of suffering. Let me read it to you. God whose law it is that he who learns must suffer, and even in our sleep, pain that cannot forget, falls drop by drop 
upon the heart and in our own, despite, against our will, comes wisdom to us by the awful grace of God. Well, not only do we, are we blessed when we mourn because when we suffer, we learn wisdom. But more than that, there is the concern for mourning over others, namely, not just mourning when there is death. We're not talking about that. We're talking, uh, important though that is, we're talking about mourning when we see other people treated unjustly. It is very, very easy for the human heart when you are in the midst of a situation in which there is tremendous amount of pain around you to develop armor. You don't see it. You quit feeling it. You somehow withdraw. You survive because you can't take it in and you stop mourning. And what Jesus is saying is that we are not supposed to stop mourning. When we see injustice around us, when we see people getting hurt, blessed are those who are able to continue to mourn in that kind of a situation. And of course, we could say third, that we are supposed to mourn over the evil we find in our own lives and our inability finally to conquer it completely. We mourn over our inadequacies and our failures, our inability to love our neighbor as ourself, and our inability to love God with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength. What happens to people who either mourn because of the pain which they suffer, or they mourn because they are sensitive to the pain of others, or they mourn because their inability to meet the standards that they have set for themselves and the scripture sets for them, what is going to happen to them? We are told that they will be comforted. Deep within their souls, there will be a quiet peace in the midst of these three forms of mourning. Well, then we turn to the third of our Beatitudes, and this is the great phrase, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I'd rather not put it that way, because again we're dealing with a phrase which I think better is translated, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. Whenever you stand in the Holy Land and you talk to a Jewish audience and you start talking about the land, there's only one meaning in their mind, and that meaning is the Holy Land of Palestine. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about. I think like the phrase talking about the kingdom, which is for the poor in spirit and not for the arrogant and the powerful, here he is dealing with a theme that is very, very precious to his audience. And he is saying to them, look, the arrogant and the powerful are not those who have the land, who shall inherit the land. No way. It is the meek who have the right to the land. Not a special race, not a special heritage, not a special family, but the land is offered to the meek. Now, what does this word mean? In Hebrew, it's the word ani. In Greek, it's the word preis. What are we talking about? Well, which word are we going to choose? Are we going to choose the Hebrew word that certainly Jesus spoke? Or are we going to choose the Greek word which the apostles, as we believe, guided by God's Spirit, translated into? Because the two words are not exactly the same. We have a methodological problem here. And the way I answer this is to say that both are legitimate. Yes, certainly, Jesus was talking originally in Hebrew slash Aramaic. But the gospel which is given to us, written by the apostles, is in Greek. And so I think we're allowed to see both shades of meaning. They're kind of like two circles which overlap in the middle, and there's an area in the middle that is the same, and on the outside there are slight shades of difference that are important. And I think as Christians we have the right to allow ourselves to be enriched by both of these. First, the Hebrew word, the word ani. This means the person who obediently accepts God's guidance. When God guides that person and offers to that person an obedience, that person is willing to follow 
along in that path. So what does the word meet mean when we look at it as a Greek word? Here we find that it doesn't mean the person in the presence of God, but it means the person in the presence of other people. And we find that Aristotle, in his Nicomachean Ethics, a book of ethics which he wrote in the 5th century BC, defines this very, very carefully. And he says that praus, this meekness, is halfway between recklessness on one side and cowardice on the other side. You're not a coward, and you're not reckless. You don't do stupid things. You're not so bold that you just, you know, sort of go out there and run in front of trains and uh, dumb things like that. No, you're not reckless and you're not a coward. For Aristotle, uh, at the right path for a person to walk was always the golden mean between two extremes. And so here he says this prouse, this meek person, is the person that isn't a coward and isn't reckless. And so he defines it and he says that the one who is Prouse is the one who feels anger on the right grounds against the right persons in the right manner at the right moment and for the right length of time. There are times when Jesus was angry. The third chapter of Mark, we find Jesus is angry because people don't care about this sick man with a withered hand in the synagogue and they want to jump Jesus if he dares heal the man, and Jesus is angry, we're told. And Jesus tells a story about a householder who has a, who has a banquet, and the people offer insulting uh, excuses, and the householder is angry. Anger has its appropriate place in the Christian life. And we find in Ephesians, for example, that Paul says, be angry and sin not that anger is an appropriate response to injustice around us. Let me read Aristotle again. You feel anger on the right grounds against the right person in the right manner at the right moment for the right length of time. So if we would put these together, we would say that the Hebrew meaning of the word tells us to accept the guidance of God and obediently follow what God teaches us to do. And the Greek side of this word tells us that we are not to be cowards and we are not to be reckless, but rather we are to be angry at the right cause against the right person at the right time for the right length of time. The Talmud talks about the second temple, which was the temple at the time of Jesus, and says, why was it destroyed? Answer, causeless anger. It's a very interesting uh, discussion. It says the first temple fell, the temple of Solomon, because the people were idol worshipers. And the second temple fell because the people had a causeless anger. They were angry for no good reason. And then say the rabbis, and causeless anger is worse than idolatry. So here we are, we go back also and we find that uh, in the Old Testament, in the uh, discussion uh, in Habakkuk, Habakkuk is talking about the Chaldeans and he talks about how terrible they are and how powerful they are and they come like wolves and like lions and they destroy everything in their path. And right in the middle of that discussion, the prophet says, their justice proceeds from themselves. That is, they define what is just. And that is so horrifying to the prophet, he puts it down as one of the most horrible things that the Chaldeans have as a part of their understanding of themselves. And so what are we meant to do? We don't define what is just. God defines it. And when we find injustice around us, we allow ourselves to be appropriately angry against that injustice. We are the meek. And to us are the promises of God. We shall inherit them. We stand in humble obedience before God. And we stand in righteous indignation before injustice in our society. In our next study, we will continue with our reflection on these great beatitudes of our Lord.